Good morning. My name is Patrick Schultz, I'm pastor at St. Mark's and St. James UCC. This morning I want to share a message with you. It's a message that, that uh, really speaks to me. It's a message that I am hearing across our nation. And I pray the Word of God, the Spirit of God is with us, the Word of God touches us, and that we are through the Holy Spirit moved to be more like Christ, to be deeper followers of Christ, to grow in our relationship with one another and in our relationship with God through Christ. This morning I'm going to read to you from the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she was conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell, his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fell or fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. When the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. It's the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning I come to you with a heavy heart. I am, as always, lifted by the Spirit of God, but I am more tired than I have been in a long time. This is not a tired, a tiredness from too much exercise or too much work or too much scholarly endeavor. It is not a tiredness of being pulled in too many directions at one time. This is a tiredness of the human condition. This is a tiredness of a historical pattern of behavior to an unexamined history of our nation. Not unexamined in the sense of undocumented, for this condition has been documented in song and prose, in book and dance, in scripture, and even in the governance of our Bill of Rights and Constitution, but unexamined in the sense of a repetition of unlearned lessons leading to a weakening of the very fabric of our nation, the cohesion of our communities and of our humanity. This is a tiredness when there was not a lot of reserve in my tanks to begin with. I'm tired of COVID-19. I'm tired of quarantining. I am tired of political disparaging and machination and party divisiveness. And yet, all of those I could manage and navigate 
come out feeling like I not only have made it, uh, but I have helped to make things better in one small way or another. This tiredness is deeper. Born of a message heard too often over the many years of a nation that has become comfortable in the hearing, the news of the death of her black brother or sister, bringing to light the most vividly, bringing to light most vividly the racial discord and prejudice that is still a part of our human condition. Now, this divisiveness of siblings' origins can be traced all the way back to the beginning with Cain and Abel. A rift had appeared between the sons of Adam and Eve. Webster's defines rift as two people or groups who no longer have a friendly relationship. A deep crack or break has developed. What began this rift between these two, we don't rightly know. They have different interests and livelihoods. Cain grew up to be a farmer. Abel grows up to be a shepherd. Perhaps this difference is enough to drive a wedge between them. Perhaps they act and look differently to a degree that they do not see the commonalities but only the differences. And there's an underlying current of something foreboding, something disturbing, something evil. And it all comes to a head one day. It is a day of worship, as was customary in their tradition. Both Cain and Abel bring offerings to present to God. A Cain, as a farmer, brings the Lord an offering of the fruit of the land. And Abel, as a shepherd, brings the firstlings of his flock. The Lord likes and accepts Abel's offerings, perhaps a newborn lamb. But the Lord rejects Cable's, uh, Cain's offerings. Uh, the rift has grown from a crack to a gully to a ravine to a chasm of seemingly insurmountable breadth and depth. And this sets the stage for Cain to commit murder. For that's what Cain does next, murder. Not a killing in self-defense, not a justified killing, not a, a killing in the midst of war or battle, but murder. And murder is such an ugly word. It's such an ugly word for an ugly sin. Did you know that it's in this sad, sad story of Cain and Abel that we see the first mention of sin. It's not the first appearance of sin, but it's the first time that the word sin is used in the Bible. If you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Sin is crouching at the door. Sin is there waiting for you and its desire is for you. But you must master it. And you might think, with God giving this word of caution to Cain, a word of caution from no one less than God, that Cain would give a, a second and third and fourth thought to what he had been contemplating, to what he had been harboring in his heart. Gardner Taylor, in his Lyman Beecher lectures, was talking about Judas and his betrayal of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, suffice it to say, nothing springs suddenly full grown into life. This loathsome act of betrayal must have been building up for a long time. This, this loathsome act of betrayal uh, by Cain 
was not something that occurred on a whim. The process of corruption, which completed its deadly work in the murder of Abel in the very fields that Cain had cultivated and grown fruit and grain in, had been going on for a long time. These things don't just happen. There is a, a, a tea kettle process that requires some heat, uh, some warming of the water, some low boiling of that water to a, a higher and hotter pitch until psh, there's a release of steam hot enough to scald and burn you. Cain's response to God's words, if you do well, you'll be accepted. Sin is crouching at the door, waiting for you. You must master it. Is to take Abel out into the fields. Perhaps in the midst of pointing out a particularly green spot. As Abel fixes his gaze upon the lush of the field, Cain clubs him and kills him. And the rich loam of the earth grows darker, saturated with innocent blood. Psst. A release of steam, hot enough to scald and burn. Brother murders brother. Fear, anger, jealousy, insecurity, envy. Stir these elements together and sin is no longer a distant thought or a remote concept. Sin is no longer lurking, crouching at the door. You've opened up that door and invited sin right in and it has come in and sat down right at the table. And I don't know why Cain's response to his problem is murder. I don't know why we continue to see injustice and racial disparity to this day. These are not new issues. These are not new problems. These are not new concepts. What you and I see happening across our nation today is not an anomalous crisis, but one in which the cries of people have been raised again and again. Ask the families of Philando Castile, Terence Crutcher, Alton Sterling, Jamar Clerk, Jeremy McDowell, William Chapman II, Dr. Otis Moss III, in The Cross and the Lynching Tree, tells of a nation in which a people gave their genius, intellectual creativity, and spiritual vitality to enrich territories and states in America a people brilliant enough to rotate crops and engineer and plant new agricultural species, design and build new homes and bridges, train horses and introduce new cooking techniques to America, expose the world to new music genres, delight the nation with oral dexterity to tell a story, create poetry on the spot to recite verses from memory. And yet, a people often feared and considered unintelligent for the color of their skin. A people for whom the word lynching is forever and searingly connected with. As a means of denuding and denigrating and demoralizing a people to control and lord over them. The last official lynching that caused death to a black man, 
took place in Mississippi, James Craig Anderson, nine years ago, 2011. And more recently, we remember the families of Freddie Gray, and Sam DuBose, Walter Scott, Eric Harris, Tamir Rice, Kay Gurley. There are great difficulties to being black in a way that I, as a, a white man of privilege, will, will never understand. One of my favorite professors at Lakeland College, Lakeland University now, was a Professor Jay Shilkut, who's a gifted pianist. And he was the reason, reason that I graduated from Lakeland. He was the first black person to live in Sheboygan. And as the first black man, he could not walk the sidewalks after dark, after a certain time, because he would be stopped, questioned by the police, suspicious because of his color. Even though he was highly educated, employed as a teacher at Lakeland and lived in a nice apartment downtown, he could not get his hair cut in Sheboygan. No one would cut his hair. So he had to go to Milwaukee for a haircut. I can't imagine being turned away like that because of the color of my skin. I was listening to the North Carolina Temple basketball coach speak last week. And this is what he would tell his black players. If you are driving, keep your driver's license on your dashboard. Not in your council, not in your glove box, not in your pocket but on your dashboard in plain sight in case you are stopped. If you are stopped, keep both hands on the wheel in plain sight. Do not reach for your license or registration or anything. When you do reach for your license or registration, ask the officer twice. Please, sir, may I get my license? Please, sir. May I get my license? I've never had to be worried about reaching for my license or keeping my hands in sight because of my skin color. I honestly cannot imagine what having that uh, constant awareness or maybe fear is like. I've not walked in the shoes of Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Eric Gardner, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd. I did, however, spend some time with their sheriff's department, Lieutenant Larry Peroni, one of our members here at St. Mark's. And I asked him about the challenges and perceptions of policing in these times of social unrest, and he had many good things to tell me about our Sheriff's Department, and Wisconsin police in general. But one thing he said in particular stayed with me, and, and I'm paraphrasing this. He said, you seek the truth by listening. I get that. Now is a time for listening, not for arguing. We're saying who is right and who is wrong, but for listening to a nation and a people who are hurting, frightened, crying out for change. Larry went on to say, Seek the truth by listening. By listening, you learn. By learning, there is self-reflection. And with self-reflection comes change. We cannot grow 
as a people and as a nation without change. And that should be exceedingly clear to all of us. What precisely that change is begins with the simple act of seeking the truth by listening. When I listen right now, I hear people across our nation crying out, How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long, O oh Lord? 